Enga mana, enga rau, enga rau rangatira, o ngā haua whā, tēnā koutou katoa. Nera, te mihi motahaki ki te kini tuheti o putato te whera whera o te whitu te whera whera. Ka mihi hoki ki a tātou katoa i huihui mai nei i tēnei ahi ahi poa. Nō mai, piki mai, tāhuti mai. Welcome to our kōpapa kōrero for tonight. Thank you for issuing forth in this freezing weather that's clearly kept several people at home. Uh, but that's okay, because we're going to have a small and intimate chat instead. My name is Bryony James, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at Te Whare Wananga, uh, or Waikato, the University of Waikato. The, the purpose of this intermittent series of public lectures is to talk about topics of interest to our community in the broadest sense that are informed by our own research. The original intention for tonight's talk was to have um, a reflection on the government's budget and looking at how that budget had reflected the recent and very public value that the Aotearoa research community has contributed in keeping the public safe in recent months and the last year. Now, of course, as it turned out, the, the budget didn't really reflect that at all. So, so that got me thinking. I thought if I travelled around and asked people up and down the country what value does university research offer, I would get as many answers as the number of people that I asked. And part of the reason for that, I think, might be that sometimes we forget as university academics to pause and actually tell the world about the amazing stuff we're doing. So a little bit of that is what we're going to do tonight. Also what we're going to do tonight, we're going to consider the idea of research impact. Now the impact of research is something you hear about a lot at the moment. As university academics, we hear about it a lot from our funders. They want to see what impact will our research make in the world. But crucially, our community also asks us the same question. What impact on me will your research have? And I think that's a very fair question. So tonight, we are very fortunate to have three researchers who will talk to us about their impact. And I'm talking about impact in the broadest possible sense, not just economic impact, but impact across human, social, and natural capitals. Now, my, my personal definition that always sits at the back of my mind when I talk about research impact is the change we want to make in the world. And we have three wonderful change makers here with us tonight. Sadly, uh, Ian White is unable to join us, so we are um, depleted but not bereft. And, and Carrie, Adam and Curra are going to share some of their research stories with us and talk about the change that they're making in the world. With a nice small audience like this, hopefully we will leave plenty of time at the end for questions. And on that note, the structure of this talk is so that we'll have around 10, 12 minutes each from each of our wonderful panellists, and then plenty of time at the end for people to ask questions. And the easiest way these days for people to ask questions is via technology. Is, is Amanda, is the app mounted up here? So if we, there we are. If you, if you do your smartphone thingy with the QR code up there, that'll send you to an app called Slido. And Slido will enable you to ask your questions throughout the talk or at the end. And at the end, they will get beamed to my iPad here, hopefully, and we'll, um, we'll pass them on to our panellists. So that's the format for tonight. What I'll do is introduce each of our speakers um, in turn as, as it's their turn to talk. And at the first speaker tonight is Dr. Kerry Barber. Now, Carrie might look familiar to you because she's uh, spent a lot of time on the news recently talking about the app she developed called Positively Pregnant. Now, Positively Pregnant is designed to support families through pregnancy, reducing the anxiety of that time and helping people transition into parenthood. Carrie is a clinical psychologist, so development of that app stemmed from her research looking at perinatal mental health. So our first speaker tonight is Carrie Baba. Thank you. Is this, yes, it sounds like it's working. Um, yes, as Brian said, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist and originally um, was most interested wor working with children and adolescents. Um, and over, but over the last 15 years or more, oh, 
It's going on by itself. Oh, we're going back. That's all right. I have power. Um, the uh, last 15 years or so, I've gotten interested in sort of moving back before the beginning and trying to get families off to a good start um, and recognizing how important, in particular, perinatal mental health as a general field sort of evolved going back, um, largely out of the, uh, um, an interest in postnatal depression, which you may have heard about. Uh, but in the last Tech decade or so, we've recognized more and more the importance of pregnancy as well, and the kinds of challenges that families um, cope with during pregnancy. So that's why, that's what we decided to focus this app on. So why pregnancy? So we're developing an app to help families as they, um, as they transition to parenthood. Um, pregnancy is a time of enormous change, both physically, we hear all about that, but also um, psychologically. Stress is sort of is often defined as sort of the disruption of homeostasis, of things that are changing, and pregnancy is all sorts of things changing. Um, so that's so that can be a stress, but it also is a, is a time of enormous opportunity. It's a time when people think about their lives and think about what's important and make plans for how they want their family to develop. Um, and so, and it's a time when they have extra incentive to change some of their health habits or what lifestyle plans. Um, so it's a time that we want to take advantage of that capacity for reflection and making change to work not only to help those who are struggling, but also to help those who are doing okay to move in a positive direction. Okay. For, so, so it's a time of change and that stress um, can be difficult. Um, most people, though, manage it well. Um, but for a, a smaller proportion, 20 to 30 percent or so, it, that stress gets converted to distress. They've got that anxiety that might take the form of anxiety, depression, doubt in themselves as they're becoming parents, worrying. Now, some degree of that is normal. Um, probably almost everybody feels. But when it becomes, so when, when it starts to sort of take over um, a person's worldview, that's when we start to worry about it. So the app, it, and that matters, I suppose. What we've learned over the last 15 or 20 years is that, that anxiety and depression has an impact, not only on the psychological development of the parents, but also on the physiological development of the child. And children who are born to parents, mothers who are struggling with that, are more likely to struggle with a number of other things. So that's the motivation beside, behind why we want to develop tools that can help um, families during pregnancy to cope better with all the kinds of changes that are going on. Um, now, they, we, we could say, okay, well, they should go see a psychologist like me, perinatal mental health. Um, but, but we know from, from a lot of what you've heard in the news in the last six months especially, I think, that, that our mental health care system um, is very much overstretched. Um, and they can't all access a psychologist, nor would they necessarily want to. Um, but there's a lot in psychology that they can access, and that's what we've tried to put into this app, Positively Pregnant. Um, now, why an app then? When I, you know, when I first started this, I barely knew what an app was. It was actually some of my students who said, I was saying, well, we want something that people can have with them um, and that, that can't be stolen. We were talking about some other computerized programs and things like that. And they said, what about an app? And I said, an app? And then we, so gradually over the last six or seven years, I've learned um, some of the advantages of an app for this sort of, of task. Um, in, when we, we first started working on this in 2015, 2016 or so, I was looking back and, at the data that we had then about how many people had a smartphone. This is of young adults. Um, at that point in 2014, 82% of young adults had a smartphone. So even then, this was a pervasive tool. I looked at this again last week to find out, you know, I wonder how many, what percentage of the population has a smartphone now, and it said 142% of the population has a smartphone. I think they must be at calculating the number of smartphones to people. So some people have more than one, clearly. But very, so virtually everybody, um, and certainly virtually all pregnant women, have and use um, smartphones. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's accessible to most people. And there are low cost, there are high cost, expensive ones. There are also some that are low cost. And we've designed the app to work on the, the most basic models of, of cell phones. Um, that not only are they 
um, accessible to lots of people. They're also available. You have it in your pocket. Um, so it's something you can access um, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis if you want, unfortunately for some people, um, if you want to. Um, apps are also adaptable. You can tailor the content to information that the person puts in so that they can get personalized information back. And that's really helpful for the kind of information that we were talking about. And it's not, they're interactive. It's not just like reading a book. It's actually reading information that is tailored to the question, the way that you've answered questions and to what you are coping with at that time. And so that what the app can link to information, both local information um, about New Zealand resources and situations, um, and also information that's on there on online, because um, there's a whole lot out there in the world for um, people uh, when they're in that process of uh, becoming a parent. So we decided to develop an app. We call it Positively Pregnant. Um, that comes both out of um, the idea that, uh, that this a lot of positive, what's called positive psychology is a sort of domain within psychology that, that's also developed over the last 20 years or so about trying to help people to facilitate sort of well-being as opposed to just solving problems to actually make what's okay better. And we're using a lot of the tools from positive psychology in this um, app. We also did a little, did a survey at the part of the beginning of development of the app, and this was the most popular name, and it's, it's a bit of a catchy title. So we decided to develop this app. It's focusing on the social and emotional side of becoming a parent. There are plenty of apps out there to tell you about how big the baby is, or count your contractions, or lots of other things. But there was very little out there about what it means um, emotionally to become a mother, what it means socially in terms of your relationships. So that's what we were aiming at. And the app has four different sets of components um, that are interactive in different ways. There's a set of things, of, of things called Know Yourself, which are like quizzes, essentially. You answer questions about your strengths and values and resources, um, your stressors, what's going on for you right now, um, what kinds of strategies you've used or would be interested in trying to kind of cope when you're stressed out. Who are the people around you for social support? And how do you think about the world and, and think about the choices that you're making? Because pregnancy is a time when there are an awful lot of choices to be made, and often made in, in, in collaboration, hopefully, with another person, the partner or a support person. And so some of those tools ask those questions and then give you feedback about how you might make those choices and how might the two of the couple make those choices together, how their thinking styles work together. So those are the interactive, those are the know yourself, taking advantage of the time for reflection. Um, then there are also a series of, of prompts for conversations, really sort of a structure for uh, having either the person and their partner or a support person um, or they can be used as prompts for individual reflection but thinking about ranging from things that are most basic like who does what like chores which is a popular topic or a controversial topic in a lot of um, in a lot of these situations what who is doing what now who's going to do what after the baby comes and then they can, the couple can compare their answers to those questions the others are more things like we like traditions what kinds of traditions do you want to have for your child and family talking about things like the birth who who do you want to be there how do you want to handle different things parenting choices and styles and those sorts so fa facilitating interaction and conversation and thinking about those things then there are um, activities within the app, which we call Do Something. There are six audio recorded kind of relaxation, meditation things, um, as well as some more journaling oriented, a gratitude journal, a journal you can take pictures and write notes to the baby, and those sorts of things. Um, and, and then some things like just have, watching funny videos, just how to relax, um, those sorts of things. And finally, there's Find Out, which are, are just bite-sized pieces of information about, again, that social, interpersonal, um, and emotional side of becoming a parent. And how can you man and managing things like managing worry, managing mood, what to do if actually you find that you need more help and how you might seek that out. Um, so it's a range of different activities. Go, no, I won't go where I want it to go. So how might this help? What we're trying to do with it is both um, help the people. This the app is designed, hopefully, to be useful to the range of people 
um, people who are doing pretty well and just want to make sure they stay that way and take this chance to look and think about things, to improve their well-being and resilience, to enhance, to give them different options for coping and more flexible things that they can do. Um, and also for those who are struggling to prevent that distress becoming worse, to give them some ideas for how to reach out for support and how to figure out what works for them um, so that they don't become more distressed and, and more uh, and have a bigger effect on the child and the broader family. Um, and to provide information and support for those who do need more formal mental health services or what are the options out there for support uh, for those people. So it's to aimed at a range of, of different situations. Um, and so then moving on to what we want to get do in the future. Right now, so what we've been, the reason we've gotten some great press with the help of our, of our communications department recently is because we've just launched a new, a revised version of the app. Positive with Pregnant was originally launched in late 2018. Um, but we have, re, have gotten some funding to reprogram and design it and it's been launched in the newer version recently. So we're trying to get that word out to midwives and health professionals and parents and people um, just to give it a try and, and see if it's useful. Um, so that's one of the big focuses now. I'm talking to groups of GPs and midwives and those sorts of people. Um, then we also, one of the things I discovered in developing this app is that it's, it's never finished. It's not like a book that you published and it's done. It's like continuing, even if, even if the information stays the same, which it doesn't, the, the program, the, the, the devices change, so you have to have continual re-fixing um, and, and, and that provides an opportunity for continuing improvement, for taking feedback. Um, we have like on our webpage, people are well, always welcome to give feedback and ideas, um, and we can incorporate those as we continue to develop it. We're hoping in the future to develop a partner version. There are some aspects of the current version where the partner is involved and answers questions, but we'd like to have a completely standalone partner version, or linked, but, but an individual partner version that provides some of the information that's more particular to the situation of those partners. And, and then, although we have focused mainly on prenatal, on the, the experience of pregnancy, there's a lot of a lot of the tools and ideas in the app are very uh, applicable to the postnatal period, to that ongoing parenting um, experience. But we might want to add a postnatal extension to some of the information for that more directly kind of focuses on those times. And then the the sort of the ideas and the structure um, of the positively pregnant this particular app also may be applied to other kind of big transitions in people's lives. It's about how do we handle and cope with big stress and transition. And there are other transitions like from university to work or from work to retirement where the kinds of model that we're talking about here might also be applicable. So those are just some future ideas that we've had to think about. And we, it isn't just me, there have been a lot of people who've worked on this project in all sorts of different ways um, over the last um, six, seven, whatever number of years, um, including we did a pilot in 2017 with, does this have a pointer thing? Yes, maybe, no. Um, with 88 um, women who tested out that initial version of the app. Oh, and now, on and up. It has a mind of its own. I didn't press it, I promise. Okay. I think that's... I like that. there. Thanks. Okay, we've got automatic transitions turned on for some slides and not others, just to, just to mess with you, just to keep you on your toes. Thank you, Karen. I, I, I don't doubt there's some mothers in the audience uh, who should right now log on to Slido and come up with some of the suggestions for the partner app. Because I'm sure you can think of some. Um, our next speaker is, is um, Associate Professor Adam Hartland. Now, Adam is an environmental geochemist. He's taken an interdisciplinary approach to environmental science, which spans the land-water continuum. Now, some of his more challenging sampling tasks have been deep underground. So this has resulted in him developing a, a particular piece of kit, which is now called SIP which is specifically targeted at challenging sampling of water samples in difficult environments. So Adam's going to talk to us about his research and hopefully his widget. So Adam, over to you. Hi, 
Hi everyone, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the research we're doing on cave systems and we'll get around to talking about the gizmo. So, um, right, good. So, um, first a little word about climate. Um, a lot of us um, probably don't necessarily think about what climate is and um, from a technical standpoint it's merely the average weather that we experience in any particular location over an extended time period. But in the broad sense, climate is actually an incredibly intricate and complex system of processes that, and feedbacks that occur between the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. And these feedbacks occur on any, any number of time scales, so from seconds to minutes to millennia. And Therefore, because as humans we've only really been observing climate and climate change for the briefest interval in any meaningful sense, um, we have to really rely and rest our understanding on geological archives, the geological record. And so that, that that's things like ice cores or marine sediments. And by studying these, we can understand things like how external processes, like changes in Earth's orbit with respect to the sun, <coughs> Uh, or internal processes like the exchange of carbon dioxide between the oceans and the atmosphere, how these impact climate on, on a range of timescales. <coughs> so within this uh, geological view of climate, caves are becoming an increasingly important part. Um, we can think of caves and the deposits that form inside them as libraries of climate history. Um, but libraries that are written, uh, books that are written in foreign language that we don't necessarily understand. And it's our job as geoscientists to try and understand those, those records, those, those histories. Um, now, within my field of cave research, it's increasingly recognised that um, to understand any individual cave system, you actually need to spend time in that cave, monitoring that cave, to understand how it responds to changes in the external environment. And with that, with that understanding, you can then apply that to the deposits that are formed within the cave in order to be able to get a much more precise understanding of how climate has changed in the past. <coughs> so, um, yeah. so, salagmites, which are the main type of deposit that form in caves um, that we work with um, as geoscientists, stalagmites form from a single drop of water that forms a film on the, on the stalagmite tip. And that film of water provides the material for the growing stalagmite. So ions and molecules are trapped by the stalagmite as it grows, but then as the next subsequent drop falls, that film from which the stalagmite is growing is reset. So we can quickly see that the fluid composition, the water composition, how it changes over time is really an essential part of the puzzle for understanding the climate records that we are able to get from stalagmites. So um, this is uh, an image of um, the location in Waipunga Cave in the Waitomo where we uh, do much of our, our research. Um, we started working here about five years ago. Um, and this was as part of a project called Quest, and that's a, a project which we initiated with colleagues in the UK and in Europe. And the goals of that project were to try and develop new ways of doing this type of science, to find new and quantitative ways of measuring past climate using cave deposits. Um, secondary, the goals of that project were to actually develop records of climate history from New Zealand and also other parts of Austra Australasia. So, um, parts of the, the, the uh, Pacific Islands and uh, Australia. Um, and so to meet that goal, we, we set about start, um, to monitor Waipuna Cave. This was our local study site. Um, and initially the objective was actually to deploy an auto sampler which had been designed in Switzerland uh, for this purpose. Unfortunately, um, by the time it reached us, the auto sampler had sort of succumbed to the attrition of time and corrosion and rodents and all sorts of things. And so it was basically unusable. Uh, so we were left with no other recourse than to start from scratch and actually start a manual monitoring campaign as, as is traditionally done. And so 
Um, once a month or so, I would go with my students to wipe in the cave and collect water samples and download loggers and take measurements of the air and so on, um, in order to, to get this understanding of how the cave was responding over time. So, um, just for you, just to orient you, the uppermost star on the, um, the map is Waipuna, and then the other stars are secondary study sites that we identified where we would like to work, um, uh, subject to having all the, the preconditions. So, um, we carried on three and a half years uh, of work, and um, we published that work uh, last year, um, and this is a monitoring study that supports the subsequent climate histories that we're hoping to produce. Now, it doesn't matter what the plots in indicate, just, just to say that each individual point on those plots represents a water sample that's not collected, um, and then analysed and interpreted. So there's a lot of work. So if we run the numbers on this, um, we, we did 36 field trips over the course of that three and a half year period, um, equating to at least 576 person hours, certainly met much more than that. Um, we consumed at least 72 pies in the process, it's essential cave uh, energy source, um, and we still only achieved monthly resolution data. Now, um, caves are very stable environments, but even caves and the waters that enter them change on timescales that are more rapid than that. So really, even in our best case scenario of a local, easy, relatively easy access site, we couldn't do much better than every month um, whilst doing our day jobs. So clearly, the, the goal of trying to develop this time series of water chemistry and water properties from caves, it, that's an insurmountable task um, in all but the most readily accessed environments. So as part of this work, we, we also had a, um, the goal of developing a new water sampler to replace the one which, um, which died. And the goal was to have something that was robust and intuitive that would collect water samples, ideally, and um, and overcome the limitations of previous solutions. So that's something that we've been doing uh, as part of this project. So um, initially, um, we funded a Masters of Engineering project here at Waikato, um, and that project was certainly successful in identifying some solutions to the problem of how you actually build a machine to collect water in a cave. Um, but we were left somewhere short of having uh, a functional prototype that we could actually use for our research. And as researchers, we were just, that's all we really want to do, is um, be nerdy and learn about caves, you know. So, we <laughs> kind of left not really having the, 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 the solution that we wanted. Um, now, the, the master's project was a success because the, the research student learned a lot and developed uh, an understanding of their discipline and produced a thesis. So, the research wasn't a failure by any stretch of the imagination, but the applied goal that we had was still yet to be realised. So, um, fortunately, we were given uh, contact details of a local firm here in uh, Kirikiro, um, Bentec, which is in Frankton. And it's a small company that um, they actually run as a, a side business alongside the main business. So, if any of you have ever been to LED stuff in Frankton and bought LEDs and stuff, then you'll know it. Um, they have this uh, engineering workshop as part of the business and uh, the, the business is staffed by former Waikato graduates and also people who are currently studying at Waikato. So it was a really fantastic opportunity to work with um, people who, were, who know the university well. And they were able to bring us forward to having something that was a functional prototype that we could begin testing and that was in 2019. Um, and so we duly and enthusiastically went caving with that box. Um, and it was actually on Niue in the South Pacific of all places that we, we went to try and test it. And the idea was, well, this is an extreme environment, quite, a, quite an extreme cave environment to test it in. And it needs to be, we need to be confident that this is going to really work. Unfortunately, we were just met with um, a series of mishaps, problems, malfunctions, um, all sorts of things went wrong. Uh, we turned the box on its side to try and get it through a, uh, a constriction and the vials fell out. Uh, uh, the box was simply just too big as well. It couldn't come with us to the places in the case we, we were able to go. So it's, it's you know, as um, 
physically, we were able to get into places that were surprisingly small and really only limited by the span of our, of our shoulders. And Brian has told me in the past that for the, for, for women it's the hips. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we had a second round, a second prototype. <laughs> and the, um, that was with some mixed success. We, we still went and didn't have something that really worked. And things went on like this for, for a while until last year we got to Mark III. Um, and now we had something that, um, as you see before you, um, it was in two parts. So that could be carried, in, um, the halves could be carried individually and then assembled, mated uh, at the, the site of deployment of the auto sampler. Um, <clears throat> and there were other innovations like screw-in vials and um, a wireless interface. So we also have a, it's not quite an app, it's, it's, a, it's a website sort of thing. It, the, the auto sampler broadcasts a Wi-Fi um, signal that you can then connect with your cell phone and drive the auto sampler and configure it however you want. So um, after much work and dedication from um, my student Seb Hooker, who's in the picture here, um, much to his embarrassment probably, uh, we were actually got to the point where we could do some, some science with the auto sampler. And the, um, we we um, commissioned five units and we um, were able to deploy two of the auto samplers in the South Island just in April and May uh, this year. So this is a picture on the, on the left, left is an entrance tomo um, on top of a mountain in Fjordland um, near to Lake Tiana. Uh, and you can, just to sort of show you, you can see there are a couple of figures there for scale, um, that these are challenging environments to get to, um, to and to do research in. So over the course of this period, probably about two or three years ago, we started working alongside the universities commercialization unit, which is called Waikato Link, and they were able to help us work towards having something that was not only suitable for research, but also taking it from the province of the research into a commercial um, thing. So um, thanks to them, in large part, uh, we now um, have a product that we're actually selling, and we've, we've sold, I think, four, possibly five units um, to universities in the USA, UK, and France and um, a website and so you're welcome to go and check it out if, if you um, have a, a spare five minutes uh, and we've started getting the word out so we're uh, using social media to talk to our um, fellow cave nerds and uh, it's really gratifying to see the interest that's there within our community from people who see the obvious um, benefits and applications of this for their own research um, but we're also hopeful that the auto sampler SIP I have, to keep, I have to call it SIP now, um, that it has, a, a, has benefits and utility to other, other uh, scientists and people working in other kinds of environmental monitoring um, for whom perhaps um, the existing tools aren't sufficient to meet their needs. Um, as the tagline says, more data, less work. Thanks very much, Kira. Thank you, Adam. Um, as an undergraduate, I spent most of my degree skiving lectures under the Mendip Hills, but we weren't fueled by pies, we were fueled by pasties. Now, our, our next speaker tonight, our last speaker for tonight, is Associate Professor Kura Paul Burke. Kura is Nati Awa and Nati Fakahimu. Uh, she blends Western science with Matoranga Māori to help coastal communities manage their marine tāna. Amongst other things, this means mapping generations of knowledge that she acquires by speaking to Kaumatua and Kuya, and applying this to the restoration of shellfish beds and the development of the shellfish industry in the Eastern Bay of Plenty. So, thank you, Kara. Tēnā tātou katoa, he mihi mahana tēnei ki a koutou, a rauranga tira mākua tau mai nei, anō te mihi tēnā koutou. Um, oh, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> what was it me? Shall I touch something? <laughs> but it's okay, because I practiced a sweet little tap dance before I came. <laughs> Wait, do I have to do my tip then? It seems to have done it. 
Oh, it looks really pretty here. Yeah. It does, it looks great here. I know. Sorry, guys. For, for, uh, we've got it on the screen here, but we haven't got it up there. It's projecting something, it's not projecting the slide. Hmm. Just speaking like this. <laughs> Stop putting questions into the slide. Oh, it's okay. Oh, I'm still working. You are. <laughs> oh, no. Well, while we're doing that, um, let me just explain what um, my work title is, Mātai Moana. And so Mātai um, has a number of meanings. Mātai can mean um, to investigate uh, or examine something. It's also another word for ocean. I know you knew that. Did you know that? Mātai, so when we say my, Mātai Moana is ocean, ocean, if you really think about it. Or it's um, to investigate the ocean. And another word for Mātai is, um, is ecology. Like, ecology, biology, or the ologies. I don't know what other ologies there are. So my role here as um, AP Matai Moana is Ocean Ocean Investigate Ologies. So <laughs> kill <laughs> But um, um, Adam, I think you broke it. <laughs> you broke it. Well, okay, I'm just going to stand here and, and talk some stuff because I really didn't do a tech dance. Um, <laughs> But what I'm going to do tonight, what I was hoping to do, was share with you some of the work I've been doing in the Eastern Bay of Plenty um, around Ohiwa Harbour, which is, um, I think, does everybody know where Whakatani is? Now the centre of the universe? Awesome. <laughs> um, and so in Whakatani, we've been working there with, um, there are four iwi partners and three councils. And the harbour is a really shallow, shallow harbour. It's exposed, 80% of it is, is exposed at low tides. That's when you can see all the mud flats. And um, so I got distracted by the concern look. But, um, <laughs> uh, and so what we do, because traditionally when we do um, marine science research, we go and we decide, I'm going to do this, I want to find it out, and I get in the water and go and find it out. But in terms of mātauranga Māori, um, some people can... Uh, some people describe Mātauranga Māori as a oh, Māori knowledge system. We have lots of knowledge systems. Every culture has their own ways of seeing the world, their own ways of celebrating, singing, dancing, eating, the foods we eat, and even the houses we live in. So Mātauranga Māori is just a knowledge system um, passed down through our ancestors, because I'm Māori, of course. Um, I've got some really cool photos, but you'll just have to like ESP them for me. Um, let me see. So what we use uh, when I do my research, I use this approach called a whanaungatanga approach. And whanaungatanga just means relationships. Um, relationships within yourself, within your research team, and the people you're researching with. And uh, it has four um, principles, if you like. And the first principle is kotahitanga. So when we go and do our research, you know, when I first started out, um, research was, as I said earlier, you just go and do it. You don't talk to anyone. That's why we do marine, because fish don't talk back. <laughs> we don't want to talk to people. We want to go out, get in the water, go for a dive and learn some stuff, come back, write it up, and, um, and carry on with our lives. But in Mātauranga Māori, um, humans are holistic um, approach to the word is we are a species, shokara. Humans, uh, people, are humans are a species of the world, which means we are part of the world. We are part of nature. So from a mātauranga Māori perspective of um, working within the world means we need to include people in our research. And so that's a mātauranga Māori approach alongside marine science. Um, and they have a lot of commonalities like marine science and mātauranga Māori both seek to better understand the world in which we live, which makes sense, doesn't it? We're all sitting out there making up theories about why the stars are there, why the water does that, and so both knowledge systems seek to do the same. Are we, did we give up? I'm just like talking. <laughs> I should have done my tap dance. Um, uh, let me think, what do I have on here? Oh, why don't I just... Go this way. Oh, 
Okay. Um, so let me go back to Ohiwa Harbour. So in Ohiwa Harbour, back in 2007, uh, we went out with Komato or the elders from the two different tribes. There are four main iwi around Ohiwa Harbour. And it's generally known that there are two main kaitiaki or um, guard, like active guardians in the harbour. And so we went out with the, with the elders from the iwi and we said to them, when you were young, uh, where did you used to go? to get your muscles. We were looking at Greenland muscles at that time. And the reason we asked them the question about where did you used to go, it meant when you were young, because it meant that someone from another generation generally took them to go get their muscles or their puppies or whatever. So already you have intergenerational knowledge. Does that make sense? Cool. And so um, we went out with um, our kaumata on the boat and, used, and they would use um, uh, landmarks and intergen or traditional tohu or signs and signals, signs of the natural world. <coughs> and they would say, muscles start here, they end there, you'll find scallops here. And we went through the whole harbour doing this. Um, and that's how we actually interviewed uh, our kaumatua because I've discovered that when we walked into a room to do interviews, I have the power, which I liked a lot. Um, but as, the, as a researcher, I noticed that our kaumata were looking and, and nannies, that they would look at me as if to say, was my answer correct? You know how you go, someone asks you a question, you go, it's weird? Like that, and I thought, that's not right, I'm just your minion. I'm, I have brown hair there, I was just the girl, but I'm not, not so young now. And so what I did, what we did was decided we needed to get out of the room and get on the water where our participants, where our kaumatua and queer, which is another word for um, grandmothers or our elderly women, where they held the power. And they did. As soon as we were on the water, they just took over because that's their place. Because it's place-based knowledge. We then mapped we mapped um, all the sites where they said um, shellfish grew in the harbour and then we went down and dove and it was really, really cold, but we did it for the team. And we went down and we then mapped underwater. And those maps, um, we didn't know that then. This was in 2007 where people didn't talk about mātauranga Māori. People didn't talk about kaitiakitanga or tikanga, which is um, customary practices and the way we do things culturally. You didn't do that with marine science. Um, it just wasn't a thing. But we did it because that's what felt right. And we mapped the exact size and shape of the mussel beds in the harbour at that time, uh, underwater. And we discovered that one bed that was approximately two k's in length had around about 112 million mussels in it. And then, but two years later, we went back and I think it was uh, around 80%, oh, 69, 60% of the bed had disappeared. And the reason for that was um, sea stars had come. Uh, the 11 arm sea star, which is native to Aotearoa, had decimated 60% of the bed. So if this was the bed here, behind me was nothing but complete devastation. Dead mussel shells everywhere, and they were fresh because they were still green. And in front um, was mussels. So I always think of that, and I think of sea stars, they're chemo receptors, they sense their prey. And you know, like your teenagers, when there's food in the fridge, and they just go like, oh, zombies. <laughs> and they go like that, and that's how I explain sea stars to our younger children. They sense their food, and they just go and get it. And what they did was leave behind devastation. At, in that bed of sea stars, there were 112, oh no, 1.2 million sea stars. It was about a four hectare bed, which equated to around 672 tons of sea stars, decimating our harbour. Um, I wish you could see my pictures because they're really cool, but never mind. Uh, fast forward to 2019, and um, way back in 2007, we had four traditional beds, mussel beds in the harbour. Fast forward to 2019, and there's one bed left, and there's approximately just under 80,000 uh, mussels in the whole harbour. So what we did was, uh, working with our EU partners, as well as three councils, 
we um, develop restoration stations. Um, a lot of, uh, some, when you look at rest restoring muscles, I just want to say this isn't what I was going to talk about tonight, by the way. <laughs> but, um, um, so one of the methods for restoring muscles, people get um, seconds from aquaculture farms and dump them on the bottom to see if they will uh, reattach and grow and have babies. But we were voluntary uh, for at that time, so we didn't have any money. So we decided that that was not an option for us to buy muscles and dump them. So actually one of the first questions we wanted to know, which our co-master came up with, was whakapapa, or genealogy. If you want to have a population, don't you need to get pregnant? <laughs> Or have babies. So our I don't know why I'm putting that in care, but you know why. <laughs> so we needed to know, do our muscles need to have a positively, positively pregnant app to reproduce or to um, restore the muscle bed? And so, I'm getting distracted, I'll just carry on. Um, what was I have to? Oh, muscles. So we wanted to know, can our muscles have babies? Because isn't that the first question you want to know if you want to restore a population? So we developed um, a series of lines hanging in the water, much like aquaculture muscle farms. And off those lines, we took muscles from um, the, I go like this, the yachts. The yachts in Ohiwa Harbour, because they're not like yachts in Auckland. They're like yachts. <laughs> So um, we dove under those yachts and um, they have mooring chains, mooring lines, and we took the muscles off those and ha we got the chains, we allowed the chains, and we hung them on floats in the water. And then we got muscle spat lines, which aquaculture muscle farms use. And we hung those to see can we grow, can we grow our own muscles in our harbour uh, from our harbour. While we were doing that, um, we started to really look around some more and realise that um, uh, industry lines that you use to grow muscles in aquaculture, they're largely plastic based, um, which means they're naturally, um, I don't know if naturally is the right word, but they are just releasing little bits of microplastic pollution into the water all the time. So, using Mātauranga Māori, oh, I need to say that all our restoration stations were identified, um, positioned by our kaumātua using intergenerational Mātauranga Māori. So we then developed um, natural resource um, muscle lines made out of cabbage tree leaves. You know, you know, you know cabbage trees, and you know when the dead leaves fall on the ground, and then you know when you go mow your lawns, and those and those dead leaves wrap around your lawnmower, but they don't really die; they don't just break up. That means they're awesomely fibrous. So, uh, and our people used to use them for generations for lots of, for lots of um, reasons. So we use te koka, that's what we call cabbage tree, the fallen leaves, the bio-waste. And with that bio-waste, we, using traditional weaving methods, made natural resource muscle mines out of cabbage trees. Free, totally free. We didn't, oh, well, just except for the energy to make them. We also made lines out of flax, and um, other materials. I'm just not even going to look. <laughs> um, the great thing was, was that our lines, our natural resource lines, or toda, toda fiddy, um, you know where muscles grow on the bottom, on a soft bottom, they grow, in, I don't know why I do this, but they grow like a family, as a whanau, they grow in clumps, they don't normally grow as individuals, so they grow as a whanau. So if you have natural resource lines, Eventually, it will biodegrade, dissipate out, and the muscles that have attached will fall as a whanau and reattach on the bottom of the harbour as a whanau. I mean, brilliant, <laughs> if I say so myself. And that's what happened. Um, ta -da! Uh, and, um, and so our lines have been really successful. We've had two generations of lines. We're now moving into the third generation this year, and I don't know what else to say. Oh, should we just give up? <laughs> um, and so I'm going to stop because I feel like I've just raved at you for a sweet six minutes or so. So, kill <laughs> them. Sorry. Um, 
Thank you, Drew. Actually, just goes to show, you don't need slides. <laughs> that, was, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got some time for questions. Several questions have been coming in through Slido. If anybody's onto Slido, you find that you can, um, I believe the correct term is upvote. You can upvote questions if, if, you're, if you're keen on doing that question. Otherwise, I'm just going to sort of tram through and, and pass questions over to yourselves. Um, so, th there's several questions here that are quite clearly from our academic staff talking about um, various reward metrics for academics. We may come back to those if we have time, but I suspect that might be a conversation over a glass of wine. Um, so, let's, let's kick off with a fairly leading question, actually. Um, this would have been possibly a more leading question if Ian was able to make it tonight, because Ian is also from the division of um, ASP. What does ASP stand for? Arts, Social Science and Psychology, or the other way around. Hmm? And Law. Alps, Alps, Alps. Um, so the question is, which is more valuable, the humanities or science research? <laughs> Very leading question, I think. So, who would like to jump into into that little trap? <laughs> we have all the, all the mics on. Neither. 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 Both. Both. Oh. I, 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 think it's, I think it's an interesting question. So, so my background is very much from an engineering and STEM background, but in, in my role as DVCR, I get to stick my beak into all sorts of people's research. So I love these talks so much. Um, and I thought I was an interdisciplinary researcher before I got here, and then I actually saw the genuine power of interdisciplinary research. And, and for me, the, the question is loaded because it assumes there is more valuable or less valuable, mm. but either or both. Mm. I think is exactly the right answer. Um, in, in each of your, your cases, you've discussed a, a sort of an interdisciplinary mm. approach mm. to things that's blended not just Matilda as a knowledge system, but knowledge systems that come from the arts, from the sciences. They're all, uh, they're all different knowledge systems as well. So, so in terms of interdisciplinarity, um, you're obviously all living it. How did you get there? How did you get to the interdisciplinary place that you're coming from there? You know, you've got app, you've got programming, you've got an interdisciplinary approach to environmental science. You, you're blending Matoranga and, and Western science and coming up with amazing transformations, all of you. So how, how did you get to your interdisciplinary place? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Missing the point of a panel yes, conversation yes, here. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I guess I... Say, yeah. I mean, I think if you try, if your goal is, or for me anyway, if the goal is to try to figure out something that will help people, you have to just bring in whatever ideas might work and, mm -hmm. and work together with the people who have that knowledge in order to make that happen. So, you know, it's about what's the goal, I suppose. That's it, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the auto sampler is purely, um, it's built by engineers. I didn't build it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was necessity that sort of led me along that path to creating it, or being, I shouldn't say that, being, it's driving, driving its, um, its uh, design and manufacture, but um, it's working with a diverse number of colleagues who have the right skills that um, has enabled that to happen. So yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's really the, the necessity of that. Cool. Um, I think the word's holistic. I don't think we live in silos. I don't think you know when you know when you. I've got five children, and so you know when one of them finally is setting the table, they're not just doing math. They're doing math by counting how many people have to sit at the table, and then we're doing English or whatever language you're talking in when you try to get out of it and weasel and negotiate with your siblings why you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> um, but, and, and then there's also like food and there's, they're probably going to sing it when they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Isn't the world holistic? Like, yeah, that's interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. 
the more we share and work with each other, the better for ourselves mm. and our world. Yeah, I, I, I love yeah. the word holistic. I think that's a very good word for it. Yeah. And far better than arguing about the difference between interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, which is a whole different yeah. rabbit hole. Um, Kura, there's a follow-up question um, which just arrived about the same sort of topic, really. Has your ecological work had an additional social impact of uniting and empowering the Eastern Bay, Iwi, and Ohiwa Harbour communities? What was the field? Was it has it? Has it? Has it? Has your oh, because you've been working in that sort of very environmental space, but has there been a social impact about uniting mm. the people in that community as well? Mm. Yeah, yes, there has. It's been fantastic. Like I said, there are four iwi. We also work with the three councils, uh, two district councils and a regional council, as well as to on the periphery is uh, Department of Conservation. We work with the Kura Kaupapa on both sides of the harbour, as well as the high school. We train um, Taiohi uh, youth, uh, iwi youth, and we also work with the regional council with their summer internships. Um, so there, it's all about kaitaukitanga, mm. I guess it goes back to the, uh, the previous question. And um, <coughs> I guess one of the, uh, a really important thing is, which I was going to talk about tonight, <laughs> um, but it was about how do we, um, how do we build capac capability, capacity, but um, access to Mātauranga Māori and marine science, or whatever type of um, ecology, biology, or ology you're doing. How do our, how does the next generation get access to that? How, what does that look like? So we, that's a big, and for Māori, we, that succession is everything. It's the next generation coming through. Short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a question that follows up from that that we can then pass over to, to you two as well, it builds on that. What, what outreach each work do you do or would you like to do, particularly with schools, to engage them with your research? Is, is there something that you're already doing or is there something that you could envisage doing with either the local schools here or, or, or further afield? Uh, I'm not sure I heard the very first part of what you were saying, but, but, but thinking of that, I mean, thinking about all this makes, one of the things that I think can be a barrier to that, to, to developing the, these kinds of projects or to doing interdisciplinary research is, is speaking, is, to, is when we get into those little silos, when you just learn this one way of doing things, then you don't have, then you can't communicate with the people who are doing it the other way. I had a little bit of that, well, I think the most, the thing that made me, ate us able to, to develop this app was finding, a, for example, a programmer who I could communicate with, who I could explain what do I want, and that he could understand and talk back, you know, that communicating across those, those worldview lines, mm -hmm. and we can get too easily into those in our different workplaces. <laughs> um, so the more we have the idea of all of those contributions, I think the more you can get interesting things done. And, and, and I don't know, it seems like it starts earlier and earlier now in school that, you know, your 16-year-old's supposed to know what they want to do when they're, you know, and, or decide when they're in year nine. And that's sort of getting people into channels. I suppose I come from a background where the sort of more broad, edu holistic education may enable people to actually talk to each other better. Do, 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 you, do you get the opportunity to get out and talk to schools at all? I have not. But very few of us find the time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard. Do you get, do you get yeah. a chance? I, I, mean, I would love to do more yeah. of it. Um, but it's just it's an <laughs> open day, really. Yeah. 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 Did you yeah. get a chance to get out and talk? No, I, I haven't been into schools mm. like, so as an emissary. Or, mm. um, but we have had a uh, uh, school students visit the yeah. university recently. Yeah. And, um, been able to work with students from Tuakau College. Oh yeah. Um, who came and we took out on the Waikato River and took samples of water and we, they were investigating the effects of acidification carbon, from carbon dioxide. So CO2 goes out of the atmosphere into water and it makes it more acidic. Mm. And they were interested in exploring that as part of their, um, their studies for NCA. But there are lots of opportunities and um, pathways for that engagement, but as you say, Time is the, mm. the greatest commodity that none of us have enough of. Um, and uh, so having the, the 
um, having the opportunity to do that is, is it's, um, it's about, I guess, how we manage our time. Mm. But yeah, it'd be good to do more. It, it, it's interesting because for me, how we speak to the next generation of researchers coming through is another aspect of impact. And today's talk was all about impact, really, and how we are changing the world. So there's a very good question here. Recently, I heard a leading NZ researcher argue that we shouldn't be discussing impact as researchers can't control this. We should be talking about initiating research. So, so what are your thoughts on where, as a very, uh, uh, we'll, co we'll concentrate on us as university researchers too in, in answering this. Where do university researchers, where should they sit in that conversation? What, can you say that last time? What did you, was the, 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 the argument is possibly that we can't control the impact of our research because impact yeah. is long term. So should we even concern ourselves with it, or should we simply concern ourselves with initiating the research? Where do we sit on the spectrum of starting it to seeing its end point? Uh, I think it's a continuum. Like, um, another thing I was going to talk about today was co-innovating. Um, in terms of initiating, like we just talked earlier about working with schools, we actually build that into our research design. Mm -hmm. And so I think you, when you work with a, across uh, disciplines, if you like, um, then you're in a position to co-innovate. And when you co-innovate, then um, research has to be meaningful. Or well, what's the point? If, if it's not useful, if it doesn't assist someone or something, why are we doing it? So the co-innovation comes from there, and then our research, we then lead it. And I can look at my slide up there. It's still sitting there. You but very see, but we can. Yeah, we got, we got but it's advantage. like um, action management plans or into policy. So I think it's a continuum. I think that there is a, I agree about the initiating and the co-innovating and co-designing, but I also think there has to be, what's the point of doing all this? Mm -hmm. If it's not meaningful, and then for, in our space, we're looking at um, decision-making tools for EWI to be able to contribute and participate to management regimes, so policy and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, that was kind of a tricky question. Good question. Yeah, that was a very tricky question. So, so where, where do you two sit on the... Um, you're just going to sit in your office and think deep thoughts? Or, or are you going to get out there and change the world? Or where are you, where are you sitting on that? Um, I, I, I think that I started off as an academic being purely driven by my own interests mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I saw something the other day someone talking about paleoclimate science which is the study of past climate states and the reason why people study that and it's really it comes from a place of nerdiness that's the main reason <laughs> we do this um, but it is actually super relevant for understanding the climate changes we're experiencing now and trying to model and predict that for the future so um, there is definitely an applied and um, an impact that comes from it, um, but the that in that continuum, our role, you know, we can <coughs> excuse me, we can generate knowledge, we can communicate it, um, <coughs> and we can work with other organisations, stakeholders, governments to try and implement things into policy and see some yeah. effects of change. But we are only one part of that. Hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there is there is a spectrum from very theoretical, trying to figure out and understand how the world works, um, which is important. And you may not know what the end point's going to be there, but it's still important. And to, to apply, I, I mean, I, I tend toward the applied end, the trying to figure out. But, that's, but, there's a, but if we didn't have some of these theoretical people, then we wouldn't be able to make those applications later. So there's just a... Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the beauty of um, working in university is we're a broad church. And, and we have the whole range of researchers within our university and, and we're very fortunate to do so. So we do get to have conversations that span the entire um, impact timeline, shall we say. And somebody has actually asked, and it's got at least one upvote here, um, how long does impact take? <laughs> I think geological time yeah. is probably a good way of measuring it. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, that generations. <laughs> generations, I, I think. Yeah. It, uh, I, uh, go ahead. I, um, I get, there was a post on Twitter actually, so apologies for that, but there was um, someone who's a, a science communicator on climate change, 
instead of saying that we actually have had all, had all the science we need to be able to um, start acting on climate change, um, that we don't need to do more research in order to, to motivate ourselves to do so. Um, so impacts, is, yeah, who knows, but you know, the evidence is there that we need to, to make changes on every level of, of society. Um, and so, yeah, it's an open question as to whether or not, mm. we, when we will, you know, at large governments and as society implement this, what science has been telling us for decades. Interestingly, bringing us back to the initial question about which is more important, humanities or science research, so, um, having both. one without the other means that neither are important. Mm. Having both is where it's at. Yeah, because um, the science tells us um, the physical basis for our, you know, why. Yeah, um, and then you have to put people into it. As yeah. you said, you're really going to do with it. Yeah. 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 Put, yeah. Pe put people yeah. into it. That's what matters very much. And then all falls apart. That's right. So a few very specific questions then. Um, one for you, Kura, how do you address the sea star predation? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> what do we um, do about this? We system? actually have a, uh, in terms of, we actually have a project with Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and one of the first questions is why are there so many sea stars? Mm. And how do we manage them? Because they're native, like they're meant to be here. Um, some people at home have, uh, quite a few actually, have said, oh, um, you just need to cull them, just kill them, kill them all off, kill them dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Did I emphasise that enough? <laughs> I'm not sure if you got it. But, um, and so, but we can't kill them dead, dead, dead because they're meant to be here. They're a native species to Aotearoa New Zealand, so that means they have their own mana and their own modi. Um, so I guess some of the questions we have, a PhD student here from Waikato who is trying looking at that and we co-develop um, her research with our EWI partners and our council um, partners as well. And in long, and sorry, in short answer, we're working on it. <laughs> we don't know. It's, it's, um, it's perplexing. Not only Ohiwa, um, Hauraki Tika from Moana have sea star issues, uh, Top of the South have sea star marble sounds. They're, they are, um, they're overabundant and they're kind of devastating our uh, bodies. Are they edible? Mm. Sorry? Are they edible? Are they edible? Yeah. Oh, we've had that conversation. I think, I'm leading forward, I think we should have a cook-off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're like, seriously, I've got soy sauce. <laughs> but um, we don't really know. Uh -huh. uh, some people say yes, but um, oh. I'll have a try. <laughs> and there's a difference between edible and nice as well, so that's yeah. A um, specific question for, for you, Carrie, that the app, does it address the issues of how others sometimes negatively treat pregnant women. An example in the Know Yourself section um, would be things like, you know, are they hysterical, are they fragile, don't they belong in this public space? Does, does the app address those questions? It, in some of the, those find out bits, mm. it talks a bit about that and about how, you know, people suddenly, everybody has an opinion about things and you know yeah. sort of just coping with those things comments on them a lot i wouldn't say there's a lot but it's yeah it's an it's an experience that many people have that suddenly your body becomes a public place yeah yeah and a good suggestion that came up earlier actually for the partner app is is that it should wake your partner up every time you have to get up to catch the move so <laughs> yes. um well we'd expect to see that in the partner app um so one specific question for you adam then speleothem research these things take thousands and thousands and thousands of years to grow, mm. and are, are you cutting them up to look at them? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that good? <laughs> well, uh, um, so it's kind of a necessary part of the process, so that's, um, I guess I don't want to try and defend the, uh, the dissection of speleothems mm -hmm. as, a, as a practice, um, but it is a necessary part of doing paleoclimate research. Um, however, there are people who, um, researchers who have gone through that process of removing a say, sargmite, doing the, doing the analysis, and then um, either returning that sample to the cave or creating a sort of um, a mock-up, like a, a cast of it, hmm. and putting it in the cave. Um, and in the long run, no one would not be any the wiser, given that they are, you know, Continuously growing. Yeah. So you know, give it a thousand years or so. Anyone know. know. <laughs> that's, how, that's how long impact takes. <laughs> however long it takes a civilian to grow. 
Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time here, and there's, there's plenty more questions we could go at, so, so we'll, we'll draw a line under it there, but I will just hand it over to yourself. If there's any last thing you'd like to share, then I'd invite you to do so now in the context of public bang for public buck. Mm. Any last thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> it was not much of a job. Uh, I think that the, um, the, the pursuit of impact um, is, is can, it can be counterproductive. Um, as scientists, as researchers, I should say, sorry, we spend a lot of the time, our time trying to sort of demonstrate the merits of our research. We spend a lot of time applying for funding to that go about doing research. And a huge amounts of unproductive effort go into that exercise every year. And uh, that model isn't necessarily the best. It's, 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 a, it's one solution, but it's not necessarily the best. Um, and I think that the auto sampler is a, an example of what can be done with a modest amount of funding and with time. Uh, because I've been a, I've been a recipient and the ben, uh, had the benefit of having a fellowship from the government, which means that I don't have to do as much teaching as other academics and so on. And that's, that time and a modest amount of funding allows for the sort of the full cycle of research to take place. It, it doesn't just happen, it takes a long time. And that includes developing relationships and working with a lot of people um, and having lots of challenges and pitfalls along the way to get to the end. And so um, having more unconstrained funding, not necessarily increasing the amount of funding, but changing the way that we distribute it would probably benefit. Okay. Very thoughtful, thank you. Carrie. Hmm. Well, I think that's a good point. I think that you know, having the time, the space, and the and and the time to make connections with with all of those colleagues, people in the community to get that input back is really valuable. And it's not going to happen overnight. Two three years. It takes take it always. I, I actually tell my students always to think about how long. Calculate how long you think this project is going to take, and then and it'll take twice that long after you've taken that, even after you've taken that into account. It always takes four times as long as you think it's going to take. This is right. Or it even should take, so... <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Kara? Um, all, of our, our, all of the projects, all the research that we do, um, we do with the home people um, all around the country. And the greatest, I think, if talking about impact, the greatest success for us is that the people that we have worked with, the one that whatever our findings are, they're useful, mm. they're meaningful, and it helps them to make better decisions, to better understand, care for, and manage their marine spaces. And two, and arguably um, the most important, I think, is that they're glad to have been part of the research. No matter how long it took, if it was, well it never takes two weeks, if it was three years, ten years, we've done one project, we're coming up to 14 years. And because um, you, if your relationships are there, if you put that time and effort into the people, it's the people that will look after the land, the water. So for us, that is one of the most fundamental aspects of all of our research, is making space for the people in order to ensure that our oceans and our grandchildren have a future for tomorrow. Okay. Kia, ora. Kia ora. So I would um, like to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Namihi Nui Kia so That was uh, a really interesting and engaging conversation. I invite you all to join me in thanking our speakers one last time. <laughs> oh,